Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. Welcome to our weekly Top 5 Friday Ski Industry News videos. Uh, just me today, no Bob. He's got some fatherly duties this afternoon. Um, but it's a pretty light week for news. Actually, a lot of topics, but they're kind of quick ones. A lot of kind of recapping topics on things that we've talked about before. So I don't think we'll miss Bob too much this week. I think we can survive without him. Um, first topic of the week, we had talked about the... FIS electing a new president and they have done so. So congratulations to Johan Eliash. Um, if you remember, he's coming from head, kind of has a unique perspective. He kind of billed himself as a candidate of change. Um, and he's got a lot of kind of initiatives and incentives that he wants to wants to implement going forward. Um, two kind of caught our attention more than others. Uh, so first, he's expressed a commitment to battling climate change, um, which is at least a, a significant contrast to the outgoing president who, who in the past had kind of publicly, publicly questioned whether climate change was real or not. Um, so kind of cool to get a, a completely new perspective on that. Um, and then second, <clears throat> excuse me, second, he promised to <clears throat> immediately begin working to centralized rights to the FIS media assets, as well as reviewing race formats and presentation. So kind of just going back to the drawing board on how they are doing races, how they are, you know, ultimately how those races are, are presented to the public, um, and the goal of making FIS sports more accessible and more appreciated on a global scale is, is kind of what, they, what they're going for here. Um, so I'm excited to see, see the changes that happen with, with this new president. Um, you know, I, I think it's change is always good. Um, and it'll be really cool to just, just see what happens. Uh, and I think this, you know, I think this upcoming ski season is going to be really exciting. The FIS season is going to be really exciting. Um, one of the reasons for that is the second topic of the week the women's FIS races are set to return to Killington in November. Um, so that's really exciting, especially for us here in northern Vermont. Killington's only a little over an hour away, just a quick drive south. Um, and COVID forced the cancellation of that Killington stop this year. As I'm sure you all know, uh, we had a Europe-based FIS season for the most part this season. Um, and Killington is officially back on schedule. Uh, and they've already kind of started working on ways to make the event just bigger and better than it's ever been. Uh, it's going to be hosted on Thanksgiving weekend, and they are they're planning other things like live music, uh, you know, other extracurricular activities, stuff like that. More more things that will uh, incentivize people to come visit Killington and watch these races. Um, so really exciting. You know, it's also exciting because it's kind of a a stop where it's pretty much Michaela Schifrin's race to lose. She's had unbelievable success there. Um, so <clears throat> great to have that back and good chance we will make a trip down and, and check that out in person. Uh, and then the third topic of the week, we kind of have an interesting tale of kind of a split ski season this year. So <clears throat> I'll explain what I mean. The U.S. log there fifth most skier visits of all time, um, which is pretty impressive considering that we were living through a global pandemic. Um, now, at the same time, resort destinations saw reduced traffic and especially certain resort destinations. Definitely was dependent on region, you know, where your resort was located um, and, and whether those, those local restrictions were, were different than elsewhere. Um, but we got 59 million skier or snowboarder visits in the past year. Uh, to look at Vail specifically or in a closer look at, at a single company, um, Vail saw 30.5% growth over last year, which is equal to about $829 million in revenue. Um, it is important to remember that in comparing this year to last year, last year did get cut short. So you know, about halfway through March, ski, ski areas closed across the country. So a lot, you know, especially ski areas with, with later, later seasons than some, um, lost a significant amount of revenue. So 
you know, that growth number isn't over what last season would have been. In fact, last season was on pace to be the record setting, uh, record setting season for skier visits. Um, but it still feels pretty darn good to, to have a solid, solid year for total skier visits. Um, also worth noting that small and mid-sized mid resorts specifically rebounded really well, um, which makes sense and it kind of ties into the next little subtopic here. Um, Aspen reported a decrease in visits down three to four percent compared to last year's. And again, those, those are, are weird numbers from last year because Aspen lost a big chunk of their season. Um, but for Aspen, which is more of a destination resort, they, they still were down compared to last year, which is, is tough for, for a company like Aspen. Um, you know, and I think it, it, all, it all tells the story, the same story. I don't think any of this is like tremendously surprising for all, any of us because we all kind of lived through the same thing. It was much easier to travel locally. Uh, so that's kind of why we got that bump up in small and mid-sized resort visits and why places like Aspen saw a decrease. You know, it was just harder to fly to Colorado. Um, so nothing terribly surprising in there, but it's nice to kind of see some stats and, and get, get some numerical figures that tell the story of, of how this past ski, ski season played out in comparison to last season and, and normal seasons as well. Um, so... Pretty cool. Um, and then we get a, there's been a newly proposed Shred Act, which would increase the speed of decision making for resort permits. Um, so this is pretty darn cool. Uh, there's new legislation being put forward by Colorado and Wyoming senators that would enable a more efficient process for ski resorts looking to develop on national forest land. Um, it's really, you know, it's pretty cool. It is challenging for there, a lot of ski resorts are on national forest land. And, and in the past, it's been a bit of a slow process to the point where there's like a backlog of applications, just like resorts are kind of waiting for, for results. Um, SHRED is an acronym for Ski Hill Resources for Economic Development. Um, and basically, they're kind of like tweaking the, tweaking how the fees are going to be used. Um, there would be fees paid by resorts that would be used more local, so kind of going directly back into the economy of the local area, <clears throat> in addition to being used to hire more, more team members to act at, or to, to work at the U.S. Forest Service to review these new applications. And there's some other details, too. We'll leave the link to the full article in the description for those of you that are interested in, in reading all about this legislation. Um, but I think it'd be pretty cool, you know, as long as they're still protecting forests just as well, as long as they're not just like approving a bunch of stuff. But it doesn't sound like that's that's going to be the case at all. Just kind of getting to getting to applications more efficiently, which is great. Um, and then at the beginning, I said we had a lot of topics this week, but some of them were quick. We have a couple more topics, kind of some loose ends here to tack on to Top 5 Fridays this week. Um, so... Altera, Vail, Boyne, and Powder have all signed what is called the Climate Collaborative Charter, um, essentially to just show their unity in fighting climate change. Uh, and then one more piece of news from Vail. Vail has announced an increase to their minimum wage to $15 an hour, and I believe it's enacted immediately. I can't remember exactly but it is an official announcement that they are raising their minimum wage to $15 an hour, which is great. You know, we just talked about how they had a, fin a financially successful ski season, so it's nice to see them kind of take some of that revenue and give it back to their employees. Um, so, yeah, kudos to Vail. You know, not everyone loves Vail, but I think in the grand scheme of things, they do a pretty darn good job. Um, and then lastly, we have our edits of the week, as always. Um, first up, this is actually from... 20, actually, we have a couple old, old edits this week. One is older than the other. Um, so first we have Magnus Grenier. Um, it's his full segment from Level 1's movie, Less. That was from 2014. So many of you may have seen this already, uh, but it's cool when, when a production company like Level 1 kind of releases a full segment for free on YouTube. 
Um, so check that out if you're a fan of Magnus's skiing, which I am I'm sure some of you are. Um, it's also kind of cool to look back at 2014. You know, it's still the same skier. You can tell he's got like this similar, similar kind of movements. Just like he's got a unique style for sure. Um, you know, now I think his style is a lot of people associate it with the clothes he the clothes he wears and and kind of skiing in a unique way. Um, but you can still see a lot of similarities, or at least I can see a lot of similarities in how he skied in 2014 to how he skis now. Um, obviously, some stark contrasts in there as well. Um, but yeah, check that out if you haven't seen it before, or even if you have, it's fun fun to rewatch. Um, and then we have a video called Create Playgrounds from Nine Yard. Uh, it's not a skiing edit, but it's three extremely talented athletes on two wheels. Uh, one's a BMX rider, mountain biker, and a, a motocross rider, um, all doing absolutely incredible things on their bikes in urban environments. And it is shot and cut extremely well. Um, some really impressive cinematography in there, which, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and then we have like a 14, long, 14 minute long promo uh for the solomon ski blade uh it is the promo or i imagine it's like a, a mashup or a collection of different promos that they used back back in the 90s uh but boy what a what a trip down memory lane that was for me um in 1998 i was 12 uh which is like or was pretty much the ideal target market for the Snowblade. Uh, so it was pretty hard for me to watch that and not remember being a 12 year old thinking, hey, these are super cool. Uh, I guess I'll tell a little story. I, I succumbed to the, the Snowblade and ski board marketing. Great job, Jason Leventhal. Uh, uh, and I had a pair of of line Jedi 89s, um, I believe in that same year in 1998. I used them four or five days uh, and quickly found their limitations. Then was at Sunday River and saw Simon Dumont going like eight to 10 feet out of the half pipe on twin tip skis. And I was a pretty darn good vert rollerblader at the time. Uh, so I saw that and I was like, I can do that on snowblades, no problem. This is going to be easier. It is not. It is almost impossible to ski half pipe on ski boards or snowblades. So it may have been the last time I ever used them. And I went and bought a pair of twin tip skis, went back to skiing, and the rest is history. Uh, so every once in a while, that something something comes up that sparks my memory. But I I have a yeah a, an image or or that. Watching Simon in the, the Sunday River Halfpipe is like burned into my memory and uh, is probably the, the single biggest reason why I didn't keep using ski boards. Um, so, sorry Jason Leventhal, but I also bought a lot of your skis too, so there you go. Um, and that's it for Top 5 Fridays this week. Uh, we will see you next week. Bob will almost definitely be back with me, um, so we will talk to you then.